So a foundation model is, you know, a term that we created about a year and a half ago, and it captures a broader, um, you know, category, it includes language models, but also includes, um, you know, vision models and other modalities, right? Language models are about language, but there's more than language. And the reason we... So is it uh, right now, a foundation model tends to be modal specific? Well, the, found the general idea of a foundation model is that it's, it serves as a foundation. You, it's a model that's trained on broad data, and then it can be adapted to a wide range of downstream tasks. Uh, and this could be in different, any different modality. So, so I think the, the paradigm shift that we saw is that with things like BERT and GPT-3 is that you have one model that you invest a huge amount of infrastructure in building, and that model helps you with, you know, all the different um, downstream tasks, as opposed to the previous paradigm where you start by, uh, you collect a data set and you train, you train from scratch. Maybe you include, you know, word vector features or something, but that's more of an afterthought. Whereas a foundation model says, no, you, you start with this foundation and you improve it over time. And, and it's just that right now, uh, the current state, state of the art is they tend to be tied to a, a type of data. So there's a foundation model for text. There's might be whisper for speech. There might yeah. be something else for vision. It could tie, be tied to data. It could not be. There's multimodal um, models like Flamingo or CM3 from um, Meta or uh, even, I guess, uh, Stable Diffusion or Dolly or other types of you know foundation models. And, and, and I think the... the Oh, point. yeah. So it's basically anything that becomes the starting point for your pipeline. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's really kind. Of, what we're trying to get at is a shift in the way that models are built. If you look at, um, let's say, uh, well, there are many examples, but let's say T five, right? T five rose to you know T zero, which then got extended, and OpenAI. You started with a GPT. Three and then it got, um, you know, you added code and then you add some other data and then you improve it to make ChatGPT. So there's this kind of more incremental process that happens. Um, just like um, you know, Colin Raffle has this great you know blog, uh, post on uh, these models like open source software. They they you know get derived. You clone a, a fork of repo and then you improve it and maybe you merge it back um but and... uh but kind of uh by definition they're like horizontal platforms and then you can kind of build vertical applications on top so because they're horizontal by definition only a few teams will build these things um there are definitely a much fewer number of foundation models and applications because otherwise it wouldn't be uh, yeah know, yeah yeah and then, and then they but, uh, they become harder to build so then there's going to be just a few teams that will be end up building these right so the, the useful suspects well that's that's um yeah i mean it's so certainly that's the way things um are trending but i think it's still early to tell i think the open source ecosystem uh, may produce artifacts that are make it you know, possible for um, many, many more players. Certainly, you know, different, uh, you know, countries might, you know, Europe has uh, only, they're going to build their foundation models. And we already talked about China. Korea has a foundation model. So there's going to be different regional uh, differences. Um, and, um, and also in different, you know, domains um, where, uh, you know, if you have private data, if you think about the amount of private data that exists, there's way more private data than, you know, probably useful public data. And you can imagine companies which are internally building foundation models that are trained on, you know, private data, right? So uh, there's probably the total number of foundation models is not going to be like, it's not going to be like five, um, but but their their the foundation models of these private companies probably still use 
the foundation models outside. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because uh, well, so like, like, let's say you're like yeah. Goldman Sachs or something, right? So, I mean, I mean you're, yeah, you're it, probably going to rely on, you're going to probably rely on GPT-10. Then you build kind of a finance on top of it, right? Yeah, it's un it's unclear to me because I yeah. think as if there's only API access, that's not enough to build. Uh, if if you, I mean, it depends on how technical, how much one you want a company wants to invest, and how much data they have, and whether they are comfortable shipping that data via to OpenAI or someone right, someone right, else. Right, right, right. So I think there's many more barriers to. I don't think there should be like one GPT model that rules them all. I think that's, uh, um, I think the dynamics of how organizations are structured and trust and cost and other things will make it so that it's, yeah, it's, it's unclear. I mean, I think it's, it's too early to tell. Right, 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 right. So this is kind of like, in many ways, kind of like on-prem versus cloud. Um, in some ways, I mean, yeah. with the difference that these models can be fine-tuned. So in some cases, uh, you might imagine. I mean, private private cloud versus public cloud. Yeah, yeah, right. So the so other, in... yeah, the other thing is, I mean, I I think it's these models are opaque, right? And if you get a foundation model from someone, you actually have no idea how it was built, what. Kind of oh, uh, that's yeah. that's why we're relying on Helm. <laughs> we try. That's I think Helm will help. But yeah. even so, I, I think just to give you some other cases, uh, there are um, you know not, not to mention kind of copyright issues, but there's um, I think security issues. For example, data poisoning is an attack that an adversary can inject data into a training set of a model and cause it to do whatever the adversary wants. Normally, this is not that big of a deal because as long as you don't let people access your training data. But in in now, the training data is the internet. So everyone can access your training data in some sense. And this is a huge security vulnerability. Or, or, or yeah, it could be like kind of the, a Microsoft, Microsoft Day moment for, you know, inside one of these large models, right? Yeah, I mean, That's people. Can, it's, it's, people research has shown that you can put backdoors behind. You put some piece of data on the internet; it gets trained on, and now you can kind of trigger that at you know any moment in time. Right. So, so, so I think there are. So, so, so that I think is a you know general problem that we're going to have to grapple with. You know, at least with open source code, you can in, in principle read it, um, but now we're dealing with these models that might appear to be working fine, but may have, you know, catastrophic failure modes in certain, you know, different uh, regimes. So, so again, going back to your earlier point about data, yeah, data is extremely important, especially in the context of, you know, adversaries. There's also kind of the dependency risk. So the other day, actually, uh, I was looking at the list of models on Helm. Yeah. And I imagine the scenario where, let's say I bet the farm on GPT-3 and for some reason OpenAI cuts me off. Yeah. It I you know the number of options isn't that many. I mean, you know, which of these am I 100% confident will allow me to continue using their model, right? Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of the players are, you know, hedging their bets, maybe they'll use OpenAI or Cohero AI21. So that mitigates, spreads the the risk around. So of course, as usual, competition is yeah. is is a, is a good thing. Um, uh, but even still, like having uh, your business kind of depend on uh, you know dependencies are always problematic, right? Because the pricing can change, at, exactly. and availability can change, and maybe. Often you want to do things that maybe the API doesn't support and and so on. So, and what ab uh, what about this kind of Percy this hybrid scenario we discussed earlier, where you take one of these language models, you pair it with a knowledge base or something else, and 
you know, then then the models don't have to be that big, but you still have to have access to the different components, piece them together in a performant way, right? So. Yeah, I think externalizing some of the knowledge can definitely help. Um, I, I still think that a lot of the capabilities that you see in, you know, let's say GPT-3, cannot just be externalized to a knowledge base. If you look at the number of skills solving word problems or generating, um, you know, speeches or writing code, um, each of these does require some amount of, you know, kind of online or inline knowledge. It's not just like looking stuff up, like sure for facts, factual um, things, you can look things up. But, um, but I, I think one thing that we've been interested in is to see how small you can make these models if you were able to externalize some some knowledge but even for knowledge i i think um if you train on let's say um a lot of biomedical data you might be able to learn patterns and abstractions that go beyond any age of document so the problem with you know doing an internet search is that you find a term and you look at it, you, you retrieve it, and you, if you're if what you want is located in a web page, then that's fine. But for general trends, um, that's not located anywhere, and abstractions that's not located anywhere. It's really the aggregation of all the individual pieces, and for that you still need to train a. You know, reasonable language model.